Good morning, this is Edward Pishka from Barclay Squares. We're in North Somerset to talk to the Secretary of State for International Trade and MP, Dr Liam Fox. Good morning. Good morning. So just to start off, since 2016, how have you found your role as um, Secretary of State for International Trade? Well, it's been fascinating and very rewarding building up a department from scratch. We haven't had an independent international trade department uh, since we handed over the functions to the European Union. Uh, so we've had to create a whole department which looks at uh, exporting British goods and services and inward and outward investment and uh, trade policy which is of course the, the really new part because we're having to uh, build that from, from the bottom up. So it's been fascinating, it's been a lot of work but I've been fortunate enough to uh, work alongside some of the most interesting and talented people in Whitehall. So Britain is now into the next stage of talks with the European Union regarding Brexit trade is obviously going to become a much more important theme within those talks. And as International Trade Secretary, where do you see the future of our trading relations? Well, if you look at um, uh, our trading relationship with Europe, for example, back in 2005, 53% of our exports and trade was with Europe. Uh, it's now 43%. It's declining at about a percent a year. Um, on the other hand, the big growth in global trade is outside the European continent. The OECD have estimated that 90% of global growth in the next 10 to 15 years will be outside continental Europe. Clearly, if we're going to be able to earn the money that we need to fund the, the spending we want on, on healthcare and pensions and so on, then um, we need to be selling into those growing markets. Uh, and that's what we need to concentrate upon and that's what a lot of our efforts have been, have been doing. How do we uh, improve British exports to those countries, how do we increase our partnerships in terms of investment um, and, and future potential priorities, that uh, uh, Chinese Belt and Road for example, how do we get share of that by partnering with countries across that region, uh, all of those things need to be done. And we also have to improve Britain's penetration of the markets that we already sell into. We made a really good start in the last year when our exports are up 13% um, on the year before and that's a huge increase when you consider that global trade grew by about 3% in that time. So um, we're making a good start, we're putting the structures into place, uh, we need now to find the markets uh, and concentrate appropriately. Sure. Notwithstanding that, Europe will definitely remain important with regards to trade, surely. Uh, Michel Barnier has recently said that the UK can expect a trade deal little better than the one that's been recently struck between the EU and Canada, which took seven years and some say that it fails to significantly reduce non-tariff barriers to trade. If the EU constantly refuses to play ball with us and actively make things difficult for the United Kingdom, purely on the basis of their fanaticism for their political project, should we be prepared to walk away without a deal? Well, we've always said that we would prefer to walk away and have no deal rather than get a bad deal for the UK. Um, I think that, that there's, a, there's a question that runs along with that, which is not just what's good for the UK, but what's good for European countries as well. And European countries have an £82 billion trade surplus with the UK. Therefore, they rely on openness to the UK market, uh, in a sense, more than we do in terms of openness to the European market. Um, but it makes perfect sense for both of us to continue to have an open and liberal relationship as we have now. This is not... Um, similar to any other previous trade agreement because normally in a trade agreement you're moving from positions of difference and trying to get closer. We are already uh, in an identical uh, trading relationship with the European Union in terms of tariffs, uh, non-tariff barriers uh, and so on. So it should be technically simpler for us to do so but you make the correct point that the uh, outcomes of this depend on whether this is a political Brexit for the politicians or an economic Brexit for the sake of the citizens of Europe uh, and it's the latter whose importance should be taken into account uh, as the primary objective of what we're doing. But thinking about the criticism that Theresa May has drawn and the fact that, well, the idea that she's somewhat a weak leader of a divided party, do you think Theresa May should be thinking about leaving her, her position of leadership in the Conservative Party? And if so, who do you think would be best to replace her? I've known Theresa very well for a number of years and she is extremely resilient, she's very committed um, and 
uh, if ever it was true that someone was in politics um, not for themselves but for the people they represent and for the country, it's true of her. Um, and I think that she has shown great skill and courage uh, in recent times in negotiating what have been some fairly turbulent waters. Um, and I think that she should continue to stay there as long as she is willing and, and happy to do so. And I think that the Conservative Party should give her support. And in any case, uh, our problem uh, in Parliament is the parliamentary arithmetic. That doesn't change by changing a leader. But what do you think about the momentum and the, the rise in support of, and the popularity of Jacob Rees-Mogg? He's been tipped to say potential leadership, uh, strong leadership candidate when the next leadership election comes up. I'd just like to know what you think about that. Um, well, in 25 years in the House of Commons, uh, sooner or later most of my colleagues get picked at one time or another as a, a future potential leader. Jacob's a very good friend of mine and he's extremely talented um, and I'd love to see him play a full role in the government of the country. Um, uh, leadership contests, however, tend to throw out unexpected results and uh, I can't recall a time in recent years where the favourite uh, ended up becoming the, the, the leader. So, you know, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a roulette game. Um, and everyone accepts that. So I think making predictions in politics in general is, uh, is fairly tough. P predicting the next leader of the Conservative Party has historically shown itself um, to be a monumentally difficult task. Right. Thank you very much, cool. Dr. Liam Fox.